we have a very valuable guest today. It is Brian Smith, the founder of Ugg Boots, a brand you have all come to love. What's even more interesting is how he started the company. And I heard him speak at a local entrepreneur event, and he talked about perseverance and he shared his story. And I originally heard about Brian and everything that he did just a couple of years ago, but I didn't realize how he started with the company and the incredible story that he has. And so, uh, and so, uh, yeah, Brian, so we'd love to hear your story uh, and what people don't know. And actually joining us here is uh, Will Walker and he works with CrowdCreate. And uh, yeah, he's been introduced to your company and everything you've done, so we'd love to hear. Okay. So Brian, we all know Ugg Boots and we've seen it from everything from celebrities to on the Oprah Winfrey show. How did you come up with the idea? Well, I, 40 years ago, if you can believe that that's when I started, um, I was an accountant in Perth and had just graduated and I quit the day I graduated because I really didn't want to be an accountant. And I was trying to figure out, you know, what can I do? And I was listening to a Pink Floyd song and, you know, the, from uh, the Dark Side of the Moon album. And the words were, you know, and, and then one day you find 10 years have got behind you. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. And that, that was like a, a kick in the butt to me because I felt like the 10 years I'd been an accountant was running on the spot. So I started to think, okay, what, where are all the big trends coming from? And it struck me that, you know, like water beds and Levi jeans and all the surf brands and, skate brands and things were all coming out of California. So I decided I, I'm gonna to go to California and find the next big thing. So look, within a week or two, I got a ticket to Los Angeles and I had my surfboard and my suitcase and I'd always wanted to surf Malibu because it was you know, something I'd been reading in magazines for you know, 10 or 15 years. And uh, I rented a little house in Santa Monica and started looking for the next big thing but i you know i surfed that first month up at malibu and then i you know, didn't find the next big thing but after about three or four months it was about october november the the water was getting cold and the wind was chilly and i was pulling on my sheepskin boots that i'd brought from australia and i just got covered in goosebumps and i thought oh my god there are no sheepskin boots in america and one in two Australians had some sort of sheepskin footwear. So I uh, had a buddy that I was with. And I said, man, we got to go into business. So we arranged to uh, get six pairs of samples in. And uh, my buddy took them all around to the, 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 the shoe stores and came back after a week and had, had about 150 business cards, but not a single order. And he said, Brian, you know, the, the, they tell me I'm crazy trying to sell sheepskin in California. And I thought, well, that can't be right because Australia's climate is identical to Southern Cal. So it, it made me think, you know, like every entrepreneur has to pivot when you hit a wall like that. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, well, how come all my buddies up at Malibu think this is the best thing in the world? And it, and it sort of struck me, oh, my God, they all surf. And most of them had been down to Australia on a surf trip and they would brought four or five pairs back with them for their buddies. So within this, you know, the surfing market, Ugg was pretty well known, or you know, sheepskin boots. So Doug and I decided we'd go out and hit, the, hit up the surf shops. And I went to the first one and I was really embarrassed, you know, carrying in this little bag of samples. And he said, hey, you know what, Ugg boots, what are you doing with those? And I went, oh, well, you know, I'm trying to, you know, think about importing them into America. And he goes, oh my God, you'll make a fortune. And uh, this happened over and over every surf shop I went into. And so Doug and I you know, raised some money you know, just as a fluke, actually. We got 20,000 in capital and we sent 15 down to Australia and ordered 500 pairs of boots because we were going to be so successful. And they arrived uh, in early December and we organized them all and, and uh, went back out on the road. And I remember going back to that same first surf shop and I walked in. Now I got a huge bag and an order pad. And I said, okay, Jim, how many do you want? And he goes, oh, Brian, you know, congratulations, man. But we couldn't sell them out of our store. We just sell surfboards and trucks, you know, and you know, flip-flops. They're way too expensive for us. So you should go to the shoe stores. And it was like, oh, oh. 
and then that repeated itself all the way down the coast, down to San Diego. And uh, we ended up delivering our first year's uh, orders. And guess how many it total? It was 28 pairs. <laughs> and it was like horribly disappointing. But mm. the, the irony is that many years later, I came to, you know, I, I sold UG and you know it started other businesses and I ended up writing a book and I'm going to show it here it's called the birth of a brand mm. and uh, it's available on Amazon but it's a roadmap for entrepreneurs and it really goes through all of the startup uh, issues that I went through and because I've been a speaker on stage now for four or five years I'm amazed at, at how many people come up afterwards and I go, oh my God, you're talking about me. You're, that's exactly what's happening to me. You know, and, and when they read the book and they hear my story, it gives them a lot of hope and a lot of heart on how to carry on. And the theme, the theme of the book is that you can't give birth to adults, right? Mm -hmm. Every business starts out with conceiving the idea and taking the first action which is the birth. So the birth of Ugg was me buying six pairs of samples. But then it just goes into this infancy. Every business goes into infancy. And it doesn't matter if it's a product business, a service business, you know, you know a new religion even. It's just going to have to lie there until it gets a following. And, and there's no amount of extra feeding or jiggling the cradle. You know, this infant can't get up and go to college. It has to be an infant. But eventually it'll start toddling if you, if you stick with it. And uh, by the way, that's when most entrepreneurs give up when it's in that infancy because they think they're failing, but they're really not. It's just waiting for the toddling phase. And then, you know, articles are being written about you in magazines and you're getting you know, video online and first customers are talking about you. That's a really cool stage. And that will go into the youth phase where you have you know, consistent orders coming in and Production and manufacturing is great. The accounting and shipping is doing great. All your, all your sales reps on the road are doing great, you know, and that you can run a business up to 20, 30 million in that phase. But if it's a really, really good service or a fantastic product, you're going to hit the teenage years. And you can remember when you wanted to be in every party in town. Well, <laughs> it's the same in business. You want to be in every major trade show and every mass retailer and it's suicidal to try and grow that fast. So it's very, very dangerous phase. And I talk about how I almost lost control of UG several times during that phase. And uh, eventually though, you know, the, the accountants come and put all the controls in and it becomes mature and you have a, uh, you know, a solid business. So some good did come out of that first disaster. <laughs> At least I figured out how all businesses start. I, I, when I heard your story and just being an entrepreneur, I think nowadays when everything comes with, you know, instant gratification with these on-demand apps. Oh, that, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that statement that you said you can't give birth to adults and just, you know, yeah. people need to realize that not just setting up a website and having, you know, pictures, that's not, yeah. what it takes to really build the brand. Yeah. And, and you see all these, you know, web video, you know, promotions on, on Facebook and Instagram and, you know, some guy talking about how so-and-so, you know, created $500,000 worth of sales in three days. Uh, and so many of them are out there like that, but they're such bullshit because the person that did that has been trying to work the Amazon system for four or five years, you know, and finally they do something right or the algorithms work and bam, they're off. But you look back after two years and see where these people are. <laughs> usually the algorithms are changed or they didn't ship properly or whatever and they're out of business. So really the only true way to build a business is slowly. The, the deeper the roots that you put down is that the higher the tree can grow. And so it's really important to just get all the fundamentals together and, and just the bottom line is hang in there because, you know, things just come your way when you're in motion. Yeah, I completely agree. And I loved your story about how you had these different sh uh, surf shops and when other alternatives came on the market, they were still going back to you and your brand. And yeah, yeah. That was the, the brand story and just connecting with you. Yeah, that, that had a lot to do with, you know, brands. Brands are interesting. You know, a brand 
is not your trademark. And a brand is not, you know, the registration at patent and off trademark office. And your brand is not the product. The brand is what customers think of you. Mm. Right? And that is the most incredible thing to learn. Uh, I was always in my retailers stores, you know, I'd be fixing out, you know, the, I'd take away the size fives and the 13s and swap them out for sevens and eights, which I knew would sell. And I was always responsive to every single request from all of my retailers. And this happened year over year over year and, and all across the country uh, as the business grew, you know, I was traveling with about 30 different sales reps in different regions of the country. And I did the same thing everywhere. So I had an incredible uh, relationship with all of my retailers. Yeah. And as you mentioned that, you know, years later when, uh, my supplier tried to find a different distributor and uh, left me in the lurch with, with sort of uh, an insufficient supply of product. My best retailers refused to buy the new ones because I'd worked with them so long on a personal basis. And there was such a loyalty there. It was just amazing mm. how many of my retailers stuck with me and refused to buy the other product, even though they missed out on you know cumulative about three million dollars in sales that year uh, but they would rather do that than buy this knockoff so wow. establishing your brand is is critical but the brand is you and your service and your customer mm -hmm. service team and how you look after your customers it has nothing to do with the trademark or the product mm. that's well said that goes back to your how deep you put your roots the deeper you put your roots in right that's right. exactly right. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's an impressive illustration of exactly what you're, you, you preached and did. So very impressive. Brian, in terms of marketing, do you have any tips or secrets that you've used through the past for UGG and, and just connecting <laughs> and building it? There? Everybody wants the secret sauce, don't they? Yeah. Well, the, the most important one I learned, like, the, that first year's sales was uh, 28 pairs. It was exactly $1,000, right? But, you know, don't be misled by that because if you look at the stock exchange page in the New York Times, every single one of those listed companies had to start with $1,000, right? So it doesn't matter how small you are when you start. And, I mean, if you could have seen the first products that we were bringing in, the quality control was so crappy. You know, you don't have to wait for everything to be perfect to start. The bottom line is just get started and all of the things that you're going to need to grow the business and make the business look better and, and, and seem better to everybody is it's all going to come. Um, so the, the, you know, I, I ended up with, you know, 480 pairs of boots in my third bedroom. So I couldn't go out of business. You know, I had my investors money there. So I started doing swap meets and street fairs and ended up selling a ton of product out of the back of my van uh, after I surfed at Malibu. But the sales were 5,000 the next year. So I decided I'm going to advertise in the you know, surf magazines and action sports magazines in the following year. And I used these models who were posed at the beach at Wind and Sea with the perfect hair and clothes. And the, the Ugg boots were like the, the major part of the ad, you know. And uh, sales went to like 10,000, which was nothing. So I got another summer job. Uh, I worked three years of getting summer jobs, obviously. Wow. <laughs> the next year I got better looking models and, and posed them on the beach at Wind and Sea. And the sales went to like 20,000. And I was, the third year I was like on the cusp of giving up, you know, just getting rid of the inventory and going out of business. Um, but I was speaking with a surf shop owner and explaining this thing that my advertising wasn't working. And he, said, he just said, oh, Brian, shut up. And he calls out to these little kids in the back room, mm. uh, these 12, 13-year-old grommets. And, and he said, hey, you guys, what do you think of Uggs? And every one of them just walked out and said, oh, those Uggs, man, they're so fake. Have you seen those ads? Those models, they can't surf. And instantly I realized I'm sending the wrong message to my target market. And when I looked at the ads, I went, Oh my God, they are, they're so fake. And 
So that spurred me to pivot again. And I called up a buddy who was running this Scholastic Surf Association in Orange County. And he, uh, you know, I, I said, Pete, do you have any young kids who are going to go pro soon? And he gave me a couple of names. And I used Mike Parsons and Ted Robinson. And instead of the expensive photographers and the setup, I just went with them surfing to Black's Beach in La Jolla and, you know, San Onofre, a place called Trestles. And these are iconic yeah. walks. They're about a mile long and uh, fantastic surf at the end. And I just showed shots of Mike and Ted walking along the, these paths. And when I ran those ads the following season, the sales went to $220,000. And why? Because I'd finally matched the image that I, that I should have been putting out with what the, the, re, you know, the, the customers wanted. And the ironic thing is that in the first ads I was running, the boots were like at half of the, the page. And the ones that worked with Mike and Ted, the boots were like not even a quarter of an inch high in the overall photo. So the rule that I learned about marketing and advertising then is you never sell your product, right? It might sound strange. You never sell your product. You got to advertise the feeling or the benefit or what the customer is going to get into their lives from the solution that you provide them. And that is something that I transferred into the snowboard and the ski industry. And then as the company grew back east, uh, you know, nobody reads Surfer magazine and it's pretty flat, so <laughs> they don't ski. But you know, most of the kids play hockey and, you know, the moms have to take them to the hockey rinks and sit in these 40 degree, you know, rinks. And so it was a huge market there, but I used the same principle of young pros getting into it, like using the peer pressure and, and uh, advertising that way. So for instance, if you had a piece of software that saved time, you, you don't advertise a photo of your software. You advertise a photo of, some guy in the Bahamas sipping a martini or something with all the time that he saved because of your, your product. So you have to make that switch. And this is probably the biggest tip in promoting your product is figure out what your customers really need or want or a pain point, something that you can solve. And then you sell the solution. Mm -hmm. the, fact that, the fact that it's a boot is like incidental. It was, it was almost like the surfer said, well, you know, should I really want to be in that photo with Mike Parsons? And if I, if I have to buy a pair of Ugg boots, I'll do it, you know? So it's almost perversely re reversed. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so Brian, so we'd love to hear the start of the business and then towards the eventual sale of Ugg. And uh, how are things today with uh, just the company and just, I mean, hats off to you to be able to start, build a brand and eventually sell it, which is every entrepreneur's dream, actually. <laughs> Yeah, and if you want to know the details, I mean, this, <laughs> this, this book is like, it, everybody tells me it's a page turner. And <laughs> what that means is they, they want to read on because they're never sure I'm going to be around next chapter. You know? <laughs> and, and so it's a really easy book to read, but it's full of all of the philosophy and spirituality and you know, all the things that kept me persevering through just amazing number of disasters. And, and mostly self-inflicted disasters because I, you know, I was an accountant. I knew nothing about retail and shoes. But again, like, you know, there's a saying that when you start out on a path, the universe will conspire to work with you, right? And I, I'm going to illustrate that by asking all your viewers, you know, when's the last time you saw an advertisement for a refrigerator? Hmm. You know, you, you can't remember. But believe me, if you needed a refrigerator this weekend, you would be in Starbucks and there'd be a newspaper open to the classified ads and there'd be refrigerators all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. Or you'd be driving down the street and you look in the retail window and there's refrigerators that you never saw before, you know? And so online you'll start getting refrigerators. So, and so everything you could possibly want in the universe already exists. It's, a, it's out there, right? There's nothing new to be invented. Everything you could possibly want already exists, mm -hmm. but, once you start out on the path, like I started out with, with buying samples, I started getting information about trade shows, about product development, about, you know, 
all the stuff that you need to, to carry your business one step forward every day, one step, and all that information just flows to you, provided you've started, right? If you're still on the couch thinking about it, nothing's gonna come. Take the first steps and you'll be it's just staggered at how much information comes along to help you. But uh, anyway, I got sidetracked there. The, <laughs> the sale that you were referring to, um, happened like after 18 years uh, and uh, I'd built it up to uh, 15 million and, and the next season looked like it was going to be a $20 million season and I knew I was going to ha have a trouble financing the, the growth, uh, which, I, which I'd had troubles financing growth for 18 years, but this was a big one. And remember when I said I was at Malibu selling boots? Well, a couple of spaces up was another guy doug otto and he was selling these sandals that had you know pink yellow and pink triple decker sandals and he had a company called deckers and he eventually mm -hmm. you know we, we met on the on the road all the time in surf shops and trying to sell you know and so we were good friends and he eventually took on a license for tiva sandals and when the outdoor market took off he went public with that and uh had a ton of money in the bank. And so I was facing this dilemma of not being able to find product for the, this next season. And, and I was in the baggage claim area at Atlanta airport. We were going to this big show called the super show, big athletic footwear show. And I saw him up the other end of the baggage claim and I just got goosebumps and I thought, Oh my God, you know, he's sitting on 20, $30 million. His company dies every winter. Our company dies every summer. So I thought if we merge them, you know, you've got a year round business with the same staff, same sales force, same everything. And uh, so I walked up and we high fived and I said, hey, okay, Doug, if, you, if we're ever going to put this together, now's the time. And so we had the accountants talking that afternoon and I eventually sold to Deckers. So it was an incredibly easy exit for me. It was like going public without having to go public. And, uh, we did a really good deal. And uh, since then, uh, right as I was doing that sale that year, um, I was contacted by this woman from London. We'd been shipping boots to all her friends for like 10 years every Christmas. It was a pain in the butt, but it was Trudy Styler, who's the wife of Sting. And she mm -hmm. called me one Christmas and said, Brian, Brian, I need a huge favor. I've yeah. just been to this seminar, it's changed my world. I need the most perfect pair of boots, you know, tall, send, eights, you know. <clears throat> and uh, do you have a pen? Here's where to send them. And I go, yep, I'm ready. And she goes, Oprah, care of the Oprah Winfrey Show, Chicago. <laughs> wow. And so that happened the same <laughs> year as I was selling it. And I consulted with them for the next couple of years. And over that period, we put together a program that, that Oprah could uh, take out. Like she refused to sort of advertise us right at the beginning, you know, I sent, we sent her some boots and she immediately ordered 20 pairs for her staff. But to get on TV, it took several years because she wasn't gonna promote something that we weren't able to ship, we weren't able to follow up on. And so working with Deckers who now had the depth and the capital to really ramp up the production and get a huge backlog of inventory, that's what it takes. And, and that comes back to the theme of my book, which is you can't give birth to adults, right? Everybody would think, oh, Oprah got a pair. Man, next year you made a million, right? Well, it took three or four years to set that up. And consequently, UG is now, I think this is the seventh year in the billions, you know, worldwide. Wow. And that was pretty much all because of Oprah creating this societal shift and, and putting it out all across the world that she loved them and, and the rest just followed. So, you know, you could call that luck. Uh, I, I call it karma because, you know, if, yes. if I hadn't have been shipping all those boots to, to Trudy in London, that yeah. never would have happened. So, you know, the, and that's the beauty of the universe conspiring to work with you. It's, it's the most infallible law on this planet. Wow. Brian, so I, had the rec uh, I had the pleasure of uh, hearing you speak at our local entrepreneur events. And right. uh, this book sounds like a must read, but I learned everything. Perseverance, marketing you know, and yep. uh, what it takes to really, you know, grow an adult rather than uh, expecting, you know, to have this uh, yeah. putting in the work. 
Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I love doing. And I, I speak to you know, everything from, you know, university colleges. I was in South Dakota last week, about 300 students at Northern University. And everyone from to CEOs, e EO is great because they're all CEOs who have been founding or, or running their businesses for several years. And they recognize many of the things that I went through. And they're all so enlightened about things they haven't got to yet. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, I love speaking to entrepreneurs. It's, it's, it's a kick. And, and the feedback I get makes me do, just want to keep doing it. Awesome. Yeah, Good. Brian, in closing, uh, what's the best way for people to, uh, you know, follow you, to get a hold of you? I know you mentioned your book. And uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just hold the book up one more time in case you want to make a note of it. <laughs> I love it. The, the, uh, the, the Audible version is available on Amazon because I know a lot of people these days would rather listen at the gym or while they're driving. So I've, I, I, I narrated that one myself, which was a lot of fun. Uh, so you can do that. Or uh, my website is uggfounder.com, uggfounder.com. Uh, and... Uh, all the contact information is there and there's a lot of really good stuff. Some samples of my speeches there as well. And uh, I think uh, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. Okay, cool. Well, listen, thanks so much for having me. It's very, you know, I love talking to entrepreneurs, as you know, and uh, I'll be in touch, man. I look forward to hearing from you. Absolutely. Great. Great inspiration, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.